The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this 27th in the Wireless Innovation Forum's webinar series. Today's webinar is What's Next for CVRS, a preview of release to WinForum standards. Um, we've got a, a broad array of speakers that are lined up for, uh, to give you information on what we're doing within the WinForum for release to. Uh, Preston Marshall from Google, who's the chair of the Spectrum Sharing Committee. Andy Clegg, also from Google, who's the chair of the Spectrum Sharing Committee's Operational and Functional Requirements Workgroup. Naveen Hathiramani from Nokia, who's the chair of the SSC Protocols Workgroup. Richard Bernhardt from WISPA, chair of the SSC Operations Workgroup. And Virgil Sempu from Ericsson, who's been heavily involved in all development related to release two. A couple of notes before we get started. First, um, if you have a question, um, please enter it into the questions window in your interface. Um, and then at the end of each speaker section, I'll uh, go through and present the questions to the speakers so that they can respond um, as time permits. Uh, the webinar was originally scheduled for an hour, but given the amount of material we have to uh, present today, it's been increased to 90 minutes. Um, uh, we hope everyone can stay on for the for the full webinar, but if you can't, uh, the webinar will be available on the WinForms website. Uh, we're recording this and it'll be available there in the uh, webinar section of the WinForms website. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it on to our first speaker, Preston Marshall. Uh, Preston, over to you. Okay, thanks very much and thank you everyone for attending. This is an exciting event for us to this first public unveiling of what we've been working on really for the last year since the SASs were on a road to certification. So first slide, please, Lee. So I wanna talk a little bit about, first, before we get to all the details that the, the speakers are gonna cover, talk a little bit about the philosophy and, and what we tried to do in release two, because it's a fundamentally different process than we did in release one. For those who were working the CBRS ecosystem, it's been a long time from when we uh, started to really finalize the specs and when we were finally able to operate the band. Uh, a large part of that was the certification process uh, to go through for both boxes and for SASs. And so we, we took a look at that and decided if we did that, just did that again in release two and came up with a large body of requirements tested them all integrally and, and walked through, it would take a lot of time. Some valuable uh, improvements wouldn't be available uh, until much longer. <clears throat> and some people might not even choose to make that investment. So what we wanted to do in release two was shift that from kind of the big bang approach that we had with release one to move to an ecosystem that could evolve incrementally driven by what users needed, what device manufacturers saw market value in, the types of applications that emerged, and to make it a much more scalable process of adoption by the community. Next slide, please, Lee. So if you think about release one, it was driven entirely by the mandatory requirements of FCC Part 96. Every requirement in release one was mandatory for part 96 certification. And the SASs were tested by government labs for all of this functionality and CBSDs by approved test labs and then approved by the government. So we had one process, you did the whole bunch of, of uh, uh, many hundreds of requirements that constituted release one. Next slide, please. So in release two, in contrast, the requirements here are really driven by industry, the users, application requests. Most of them are not, in fact, all of them at the, time, at the current point, are not part of FCC compliance. And so that gave flexibility to think about these requirements differently. So what we did is set up a scheme where there are no mandatory requirements at all in release two. It's a Chinese menu of features that individual SASs, CBSDs, and users can invoke. The only mandatory requirement is that you would support the framework that allows you to discover those features. But after that, it's driven by markets, it's driven by needs, so there could be a different set of release two features that say are popular for fixed wireless, 
and a different set that are very, very valuable to private networks. And you as vendors or operators can pick and choose which pieces you want to support. Associated with that, and perhaps most critically, was to have a process that allowed the testing level to be driven by the potential interference impact. If an enhancement has no effect on interference, such as how frequencies are assigned within a range of acceptable frequencies, then that's something that should be testable by industry because it has no impact on incumbents. Something like, say, two-dimensional antenna patterns that we'll talk about that has impact on interference might have a more rigorous testing. So in order to get these features out, we wanted to move to a scheme where each of these units was independently testable uh, and releasable and adoptable so they can have their own life cycle uh, and move as rapidly as possible to adoption. Next slide, please. So release two has three fundamental components and we'll be talking about these today. The details may change as we go through the final ballot process. Um, so stay tuned, but uh, the framework I, don't, I think is pretty fixed. We have a mandatory discovery feature for SASs and CBSDs. That allows the two interacting bodies, CBSDs and SASs, SASs and SASs, to understand what features are supported. So your box can make the most use of a SAS or a SAS can make the best use of a box. We have a new process to develop, document, and define the testing for these optional features. How do you deploy them? Again, dependent upon what's their impact on interference. And then we have really an open-ended set of optional features that are available for implementation by SAS or CBSD vendors based on market demand applications and cost. So WinForum is not dictating you must do all these things. We're saying these things have an approved industry standard way of implementation, and then you can let the market demand pick and choose. Each of these, therefore, is standalone and as much as we can and independent. So it's a fundamentally different regime, one we think is more adapted to the various environments uh, and applications that are growing up in, in the CBRS ecosystem. If you don't do anything, a SAS and CBSD inherently defaults to no support for release two discovery, and therefore it's completely a release one. So we have backward compatibility for boxes and SASs that might not choose to deploy. So we think we've made the movement to release two much less dramatic, much less expensive, and hopefully much less time consuming than the process we had to go through to meet the minimum requirements of the FCC. Next slide. So why do you care about release two? If you came to this webinar, I assume you do, so that's kind of the first step. But what's really important, and, and as you look at this, what are the, the big features you should walk away with? First of all, we've got, I've got a framework that allows us to rapidly incorporate new features and, and methods into the WinForum specifications and get them implemented. You can individual features can be selected by vendors and users. You can look, check off the profile that you need uh, for an application and then look for vendors that fully support that. You don't necessarily have to support features that you don't need just because they were bundled with other features that you do. We've made the certification and testing complexity, scope, i.e. cost and schedule, uh, driven by the specific impact of that feature on the incumbent protection that Part 96 has to provide by regulation. And we've got proprietary features, or the opportunity for proprietary features to be implemented into the same discovery. So a, a SAS could broadcast a vendor-specific functionality that's available, and boxes could recognize when that functionality was available. So these, this, this whole feature set can be extended for specific applications by vendors or other organizations. So it's, it's an open-ended framework versus the very uh, closed uh, and mandatory structure we had in release one. And that's it. So as you go to the rest of the slides, again, I want to caution, we're still in the process of going through ballot on this material. There might be some minor changes that, that people make that, that improve it, but the fundamental content in this, this whole presentation should not change in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thanks, Preston.
So are there any questions thus far? If so, um, please type them into the question window and I'll, I'll pass them on to the presenter. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so Perfect. Let's move. That I'll turn it on over to Andy Clegg, who's going to talk about release two requirements. Andy? All right. Uh, thanks, Lee. Thanks, Preston. Um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the way the Spectrum Sharing Committee works, uh, we have various working groups. Uh, I chair Working Group One, and the purpose of Working Group One is we come up with the with the with the with the fundamental functional and operational requirements uh, for systems operating in CVRS. So it's sort of the broad overview of <clears throat> what we need to do in order to get systems working in CVRS. Uh, we have to do this because the FCC rules lay out a framework for CBRS, but there's many, many, many details of how you actually implement those rules into a working ecosystem. And that's what the purpose of uh, WinForum Working Group 1 is. Uh, we have other groups, uh, for example, Devin speaking later with Working Group 3, that take those requirements and turn them into protocols and other aspects to actually implement them. And then we have a working group four that creates uh, test and certification requirements to actually test the functionality and make sure SASs and CBSDs are doing what they need to. So that's just a very quick background on where we are. So I'm going to speak upon the uh, functional and operational requirements that are going into release two. So I can get the first slide, please, Lee. Okay, so... Uh, as you can imagine, as you expect, we already have a release one. Um, Preston talked about it. Release one was what we needed to get off the ground and meet the basic FCC requirements to build SASs and CBSDs and the related infrastructure in CBRS. Um, and so the release one uh, functional and operational requirements are all contained in WinForm Technical Specification 0112. That document is freely available on the WinForum website. It's been balloted uh, and has been stable now for uh, probably going on a year or so. Um, but that lays out the release one standards, and that's the, the those are the standards upon which the current uh, SASs and CBSDs are operating. Um, and it's also what we were were certified against by the FCC. Uh, so in Trying to evolve and innovate uh, is the purpose of moving towards release two. So we want to start adopting new features and you know what we've learned from release one uh, so we can improve things, we can innovate, uh, we can do new things and we can we can move on to new capabilities. That's the purpose of creating uh, release two requirements. And so the release two requirements are contained in a new technical specification, which is TS1001. Now, that document has gone through uh, one ballot process, so we're essentially on the very early first version of that document. Um, and the, the good news is that that document is not stable, uh, and the lack of stability means that we are constantly adding to it and improving it. Um, and in fact, the revisions to TS-1001 that will come over time is really the expression of the innovation and the evolution of SAS control of shared spectrum in CBRS. Um, so at the moment, there are no SASs or CBSDs that are certified to release two standards. So it effectively means we are not actually using any of the release two features yet. Um, we have to discuss with the FCC how uh, how the certification and approval process to adopt new features will, will work. We're in the process of talking to them uh, about that at this moment. Um, and Virgil Stimpu from Ericsson, who will be speaking later on, he'll give a, a, a little bit of uh, a discussion and explanation of how that future certification, how we envision that future certification uh, going. So as Preston alluded to, um, Release two is really a whole new uh, way of creating technical specifications. Um, release one, you know, the spec is uh, a couple hundred pages, I think, and uh, you know, it's kind of uh, written in stone and it's uh, it's balloted all in one big chunk. And so when you go to ballot with it, generally anybody can comment and 
attempt to modify any part of it. And uh, it's, it's a pretty unwieldy process to get a document, uh, standards document that size, uh, changed and, and validated. So release two, we're taking a uh, different tactic uh, for the functional requirements specification. Um, and that is we have really just a skeletal front piece to the specification that has essentially one requirement uh, uh, class defined in that front piece. And then the rest of the document consists of annexes, which are the actual requirements to implement new features. And if you have an idea for a new feature that you want to uh, implement and get in the standard, all you have to do is come with your standalone annex and that standalone annex can be validated separately and approved um, and then added to the document. So it's a very much uh, more lightweight process to getting um, features changed and improved and, uh, and added to the standards. So it's a very extensible standard and uh, we're very excited about how this has been working so far. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to give right now is a very high level overview of the release two features that have been approved by WinForum or are in the process of being balloted or are currently under active development. We have a lot of features that are future features that don't meet those categories. For example, um, migrating to more advanced propagation models and things. So I'm not going to discuss that because those are still under uh, consideration and, and, and they're a little bit farther out. But the ones I'm going to talk about today are the ones that are sort of the nearer term uh, features that are the first ones to be adopted um, in release two. And as Preston said, you have to keep in mind that anything we discuss here that has not been validated and actually some of the stuff that has been validated is subject to change or modification or removal or, or whatever. So, you know, there's just keep in mind that this is subject to flux, which is actually one of the benefits of uh, the release two framework. So the next slide, please, Lee. So uh, there is only one so far required uh, feature in release two. Um, and it's required for a good reason. The feature name is called Capability Exchange. What that means is that under release two, a spectrum access system or a SAS and a CBSD can negotiate with each other to understand what release two features each of them support. So a SAS doesn't have to support every release two feature and a CBSD doesn't have to um, support every release two feature. They can pick and choose which features they uh, want to support. The manufacturers or the SAS admins can choose which features they want to support. And so a SAS, when a CBSD tries to register with a SAS and wants to do something, they've got to negotiate and understand which features each, each one of them mutually supports. We call that capability exchange. And that's the only required feature under release two, because to get release two to work, the, the two entities need to understand what each one is capable of. Um, now, if a, for example, a release two capable CBSD communicates with a SAS that only speaks release one, uh, the SAS will not understand the capability exchange process because that's a, a release two feature and it's not necessarily backwards uh, compatible with release one. Uh, in that case, the two systems just default to release one. Uh, so if either the CBSD or the SAS doesn't understand capability exchange or understand the concept of release two at all, then the default is that both of them drop down to release one. So it's basically the way we're functioning today. Um, and there's also situations where if you have a geographic area where you have a combination of SASs that some operate under release one only and others are capable of release two, there's a bit of coordination between the SAS administrators that need to take place so that the SASs communicating with each other are able to understand each other. So the default again is to drop down to release one if you have to, uh, but uh, you know, there's, so release one is always a safe harbor. That's, that's sort of the bottom line, but we're hoping that, uh, that the SASs and the CBSDs migrate to release two fairly uh, quickly. So capability exchange, that's feature number one, and that's the only required feature in release two. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. So uh, 
in the version of TS-1001, which is a release to spec um, that is uh, posted at the moment, uh, one, the first uh, optional feature that we've added to 1001, to release two, is a single frequency group. Um, and this allows a group of CBSDs to self-identify with a SAS and tell the SAS that they all need to be on the same frequency. And if the frequency has to be reassigned because of incumbent activity or whatever, they need to move in a synchronized fashion all together to the new, uh, to the new uh, frequency. This is to support a variety of operating modes, including customer premise equipment CBSDs, where you're relaying your internet service from one CBSD through another in order to provide, for example, rural broadband. Um, and also some DAS installations where the various components of the DAS all need to stay on the same frequency within the building. Um, and so they could be collected into a single frequency group. And so if they ever need to change frequencies, the SAS knows to change them all uh, collectively. Um, so that is currently balloted and approved in release two. It's in the version that's posted online right now. However, um, in the next version of 1001 that has not uh, gone through ballot yet, it will be going through ballot uh, in a matter of days. Um, we've actually expanded this concept um, and we've instead gone to what we call enhanced grouping features. So it's a suite of uh, features related to single frequency groups and, and similar concepts. Um, but we've, we've, we've put it all collectively under a catch-all called enhanced uh, grouping features. Um, and so this spells out additional explicit group types um, to support for specific use cases, again, for CPE, CBSD, and for different kinds of SASs. Um, and it also revises some critical definitions and extensions that are in the standard that support uh, passive DAS, uh, which is under development in the working group. That, that, those revised definitions will not quite make it into this next version that's going to ballot, but uh, there should be one following behind that fairly uh, rapidly, probably in, the, in a couple of months or so, uh, with these uh, definitions and, and some further um, expansion. So, uh, so that's the single frequency group concept that is already um, balloted and incorporated and it will evolve slightly in the in the version that's going to ballot um, shortly. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. Uh, so another optional feature is uh, 2D antenna patterns. Um, and this refers to a spectrum access system uh, using both the azimuth and elevation patterns in determination of uh, interference and coexistence and things like that. Um, many people are confused by this. Um, the fact is uh, 2D antenna patterns uh, is actually the proper term for what a lot of people call 3D antenna patterns. Uh, we call them 2D because they really are just two dimensions, there really is just two dimensions involved, uh, azimuth and elevation. Um, and so the proper term is 2D. Um, in the revised version of TS-1001 that is going to ballot shortly, um, the nomenclature we've changed from 2D antenna patterns to enhanced antenna patterns. So uh, you'll see that uh, change coming up in the, uh, in, the, in the version that's going to ballot soon. So what actually is incorporated in the, uh, in, in the standard is a method to estimate the antenna gain at any arbitrary azimuth and elevation when only the principal plane, horizontal and vertical antenna patterns are available. So it's uh, sort of an interpolation or estimation algorithm, uh, fairly heavy on uh, geometry, uh, but it tells the SAS how to implement how to how to predict what the antenna gain is at a particular azimuth and elevation if all you have is the uh, is a single plane azimuth and elevation pattern. Um, it also provides uh, uh, instructions for how to interpolate to get an antenna gain at any azimuth and elevation when you are given an actual 2D antenna pattern. But the antenna pattern may be gridded at a set of our, at, of azimuths and elevations, and you may need to get a value at some um, intermediate point in the grid and the mathematical algorithms for doing that are included in the enhanced antenna patterns uh, 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 functionality in TS-1001. 
So the 2D antenna pattern is validated and improved for release two, and we're just rephrasing it as enhanced antenna patterns uh, for the next version that'll be validated shortly. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. And finally, a very simple uh, optional feature uh, in our draft revision, the TS-1001 that will be validated shortly is the ability for a customer premise equipment, CVSD, to indicate uh, that it is operating in such a mode. And again, a CPE CVSD is essentially a CVSD that's relaying its connection to the SAS through another CVSD so that you could provide a broadband service to a home or an office that has no back channel to get, uh, to, to get authorization from a SAS. So you basically bootstrap your authorization through another uh, CVSD. Um, and again, we, we predict that this will be used extensively for providing uh, rural broadband um, services uh, from wireless internet service providers and, and such. And there are some special considerations as to what a SAS needs to know about a CPE CVSD. And so the ability for uh, such a CVSD to identify itself to the SAS uh, is a useful feature. So that's NTS 1001 uh, going to ballot shortly. Uh, so, like mentioned, we have uh, various other things in the pipeline, enhanced propagation models and clutter models and things like that. Those are uh, slightly longer term. Those are not in the upcoming um, version to be validated, but it's something to look forward to. And if you'd like to participate, please consider uh, joining WinForum and joining into the uh, consideration of uh, future features and release two. Um, next slide, Lee, I think that's it, but uh, just want to make sure. That is it. So uh, we will turn it back to Lee. Sure. So a couple questions have come in. Uh, the first is, which release two features do you believe will be implemented first? Um, so yeah, so it's a good question. Um, really, what's driving the release two uh, features are uh, the perceived need for those features. So I believe the grouping, I, so basically both the grouping and the 2D antenna patterns are what I see as uh, as two of the more uh, desired fe features to, to implement. The, the single frequency group is important for, again, CP, CBSDs and for DAS, and DAS is a uh, kind of a significant uh, use case for this. And the 2D antenna patterns, um, that, will enable us to uh, greatly improve spectrum efficiency because current generation SASs cannot take the vertical plane pattern of an antenna into account. So if you're using down tilt and you have significant suppression of your signal off towards the horizon, unfortunately that's not taken into account in the, uh, in the coexistence calculations with other GAA or PAL or with incumbents. Um, but in fact, it's a very important criterion. Um, and so uh, it will, I believe, in, and I think uh, you know, those of us who put that into the standard believe that this will greatly improve um, the ability to use spectrum in areas where right now it's predicted that you'll cause interference because you're not able to take down tilt into account. So I think those two features will be the first to be implemented. Um, and we're very much looking forward to doing that. There is a little bit of a hurdle, especially in the use of 2D antenna patterns for uh, protecting incumbents. We have to get that through an approval process at the FCC, and we don't quite know. Virgil will talk a little bit more about this later, but we don't quite know how involved that approval process will be. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, quite a number of questions come in. I think we have time for, for one more. Uh, the next question is what grouping, uh, what will the grouping have to specify? Uh, what type of group or is there a general catch-all default for, for groups? It will not have to specify what type of group it is. Uh, it only needs to specify that it wants to be grouped uh, into a particular group with other CBSDs, but it's not required to express the group that it's going to be grouped. It's not required to express the type of group it's operating in. 
Okay, and that was quick. So one final question, what's the timeline for availability of release two features for SASIS and CVSD to start supporting? So um, Virgil will talk a little bit about this later. Uh, we were dividing the features into uh, non-regulatory impacting and regulatory impacting. So a regular regulatory impacting feature is something that uh, might impact the assumptions that uh, are, are based upon Part 96 rules, for example, protecting incumbents. Non-regulatory impacting are things like single frequency groups that really, uh, you know, the, the FCC and DOD need not be concerned about this type of, of behavior of grouping CBSDs into single frequencies because it really has no impact whatsoever on incumbent protection. It's already taken care of by uh, the SAS's uh, uh, calculation engine. Um, so something like single frequency groups can be implemented re relatively rapidly, but as Virgil will des describe, we really have to get permission to do any changes to our SAS's uh, or CBSDs. Um, from the FCC and the framework for doing that has not been so settled yet. So a short way of answering your question is, it depends a lot on the feedback we get from the FCC and we're hoping to get that feedback here in the coming, you know, uh, I, I hope a short time frame, uh, you know, one or two months kind of thing. But then after that, how long it takes to implement should be something like a single frequency group. Once we're given the go ahead by the commission to do something like that, uh, getting tests, created, protocols created if necessary, um, and actual implementation in a SAS and uh, beta testing. Uh, it's hard for me to estimate, but you know, I, I think we're talking a matter of months. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, so thanks. our next speaker is Naveen Hathramani from Nokia. And Naveen, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Lee. So I'm going to walk you all through the protocol aspects. So Andy has walked you all through uh, what all the requirements are for all the different features in release one. And I'm going to look at the, all these features from a protocol aspect point of view. So we move on to the next slide, please. So before we go into the protocol aspects, this slide just shows uh, where you can find the release two technical specifications for uh, the working group three. So for release one, we had TS-16 and TS-96, which captured the protocol aspects of the SAS to CBSD interface and the SAS to SAS interface. For release two, um, I've highlighted here, everything in release two again, once again, is optional. But if you plan to implement release two, the specifications you would need to follow are TS-3002 and TS-3003. TS-3002 takes care of the SAS to CBSD interface and TS-3003 takes care of the SAS to SAS interface. To support the release two uh, specifications, there are two policy documents which are interesting. One of them is the SSC 10. And this policy document uh, captures all the different grouping, uh, grouping information of uh, wind forum recognized group types. So we will talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the enhanced grouping feature. And then we have the policy document SSC 12. So we're here, just like Andy mentioned, there are a lot of features which are captured in TS-1001, which captures the requirements for WIM forum defined features. But in order to enable full flexibility within the WIM forum, we also allow for third party proprietary features to be implemented in release two. And to do this, what we require from anyone who wants to implement a proprietary feature is for them to register a prefix to the feature. So this prefix to the feature would be used uh, as part of the feature ID, and this would avoid namespace collision uh, when uh, SAS and CBSD exchange the set of features they support. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Perfect, okay, so from a TS3002 point of view, again, this is the SAS to CBSD interface. Uh, we specify what it really means to be uh, release two capable. So if you want to be compliant with release two, there's a certain set of minimum uh, things you need to do. So the first one is to support the feature capability exchange. Uh, and apart from that, that is just the basic. So this will allow for CBSD and SAS to exchange what feature IDs they support. 
And on top of that, we also have to support certain release two parameters. So the two sets of parameters that have to be supported. And one is the release two parameters, which are marked as mandatory. So these are new parameters in release two. And we will, I'll give an example of that in the following slide. And then there are other parameters which are existing release one parameters, but which have been enhanced in release two. And the ones of these release to enhancement parameters, which have been marked as mandatory, also have to be supported. These parameters are typically uh, parameters like the antenna gain of the CBSD, which in release one was limited to integer values. And now in release two, we, we change it to allow for floating point values also. So it just uh, increases the accuracy. So these release to enhanced parameters, which are marked as mandatory, also have to be supported by CBSD and SAS to claim release two compliance. And the last one that has to be supported by both, uh, to, that has to be supported to claim release two compliance, is the new response codes. So any new response code which is marked as release two and is set as mandatory has to be supported. So these four items again uh, need to be supported to claim uh, your release to SAS or CBSD. Now since release two is totally optional we can have an ecosystem where you have some CBSDs uh, which are of release one and some CBSDs are release two and the same with the SAS. So we have to decide on how these uh, CBSD and SAS of different capability are going to interoperate. And this is all defined in the backward and forward compatible principle, compatibility principles. And it's kind of summarized on the table on the right. And the table on the right basically tells you that the CBSD and SAS can only operate in uh, release two operation mode if both of them are release two capable. If either one of them is uh, capable of release one only, then they both have to fall back to release one operation. Okay. And when you fall back to release one operation, again, you fall back to, or you do not use any of the mandatory uh, release two enhanced parameters or any of the release two features. It's all as per the release one specs as per TS-16 and TS-96. Next slide, please. So the whole release two is anchored on this feature. Uh, uh, and this is the feature capability exchange, which Andy, which Andy also went over. So the idea is it, this feature provides the means for CBSD and SAS to exchange the feature IDs and feature de details they're capable of supporting. So uh, from the previous slide, we saw that there was no, uh, there's no mandatory to support any feature to claim release to compliance. You could have support just the basics that we explained in the previous slide and none of the features uh, to be released to capable. So CBSD and SAS could both support a different feature set and they could both decide to enable uh, different feature sets for operation in different scenarios. So they're the means for the CBSD and SAS to uh, agree on a common feature set is provided by this feature capability exchange procedure. The way it basically works is the CBSD would uh, inform the SAS of all the features it operationally wants to support. The SAS would uh, process those and check against which features it supports, and then it would inform the CBSD of the features it supports. And that way CBSD and SAS would operate on a common list of features. This feature capability exchange procedure, it's triggered during registration. And it can also be triggered outside registration anytime there's a change in the supported features. So the CBSD can trigger, uh, initiate, can initiate a feature capability exchange request message as shown on the right at any time it wants. If the SAS, however, decides uh, there's a change in the features it supports, it can inform the CBSD of this change via a parameter in the spectrum inquiry, grant, heartbeat, or relinquishment procedures. So by this parameter, it tells the CBSD to trigger this feature capability exchange procedure. Anytime uh, this feature capability exchange procedure is, is triggered, SAS and CBSD have to include all the, uh, the CBSD has to include all the supported parameters it wants to use during the operation. This is not a delta list of parameters of the, or including only the new parameters it wants to include. It has to include all, and by including all, the SAS then can be aware if the CBSD has decided to add new parameters or drop, uh, sorry, add new features or drop some features 
from what it was supporting before. And uh, it also allows uh, for SAS and CBSD to be synchronized uh, all the time on the set of features they support and they operate with. Uh, during this feature capability exchange, you, you exchange feature IDs and these feature IDs, the WinForm specified feature IDs for the SAS to CBSD interface are specified in TS3002. And like I mentioned before, if you want to use a third party proprietary feature, you would also include it in this feature, uh, feature ID, the feature ID for that feature during this capability exchange procedure. Okay, next slide. So the feature capability exchange provides the basis to support all the other features that we specify. And one of the features we've specified is the enhanced group handling. So at the top right, you can see the feature ID for this. Uh, it's specified with the prefix WF to signify that it's a WIMPORM specified feature. And what this feature does, it allows for, it enhances what we were supporting in terms of grouping information exchange in release one. So the enhancements are basically, you can do, you can exchange grouping information outside the registration procedure. And then the SAS can also relay group grouping configuration information to the CBSD. And this is done uh, through uh, outside the registration procedure during registration procedure also. The group types that can be supported and can be exchanged uh, are defined in SSE 10. Some of those group types are defined by WinForum and for those defined by WinForum that have certain requirements, those are defined in TS 1001 and Andy covered some of those. Uh, so during this exchange, uh, it is expected that the CBSD will include all the groups that it's currently a member of. And it may include for these groups that it's a member of, it may include updated information for these groups if anything has changed. And it all, should also include all the new groups it desires to be a member of. So again, this is just like the feature capability exchange. We, we do not do Delta updates. We always include, we do not only, uh, when we provision the group information, grouping information to the SAS, it's not only the Delta, we provide the whole thing. So then the SAS can derive what the Delta is. And uh, the other enhancement we've done in release two for the grouping type is, since now we have support many more group types, is the, CBS, the SAS can inform the CBSDs of the group types it supports or not in the responses. And when it informs the CBSD of the ones it supports or not, for the ones it supports, it can also include the grouping configuration information. There can be scenarios where you have a SAS uh, and a CBSD operating in release two mode. And one of them, either the SAS or CBSD, does not support the group handling this enhanced group handling feature. This does not mean you can't use any grouping. This just means that you have to fall back to the release one uh, grouping types that are specified, which currently is only the coexistence group. Okay, next slide. The other, the next feature we've specified, or we're working in specifying for TS3002 is the enhanced antenna pattern. And as Andy explained, this would allow to obtain higher spectral efficiency in the CBRS band. So the enhancements are uh, a couple. First one is the support of the vertical 3DB beam width. And then the second one is support for 1D horizontal and 1D antenna, 1D, 1D vertical antenna pattern or 2D antenna pattern. And for this, uh, for this case, instead of sending the whole antenna pattern over the SAS to CBSD interface, what we do is we just send an antenna pattern identifier to the SAS. And then the SAS would use this antenna pattern identifier to search in an antenna pattern database the related antenna pattern. So the framework for the antenna pattern database is specified in TS5006 and is undergoing ballot process now. Uh, so the with this enhanced antenna pattern, there are many mean there are many ways and forms that the CBSD can uh, provide the SAS information as an antenna pattern, and all of them can use can be used together. 
So the CBSD could choose to provide all the release one mandatory parameters related to the antenna pattern together with uh, some or all of the release two. So what does, how the SAS uh, decides which one to use is specified in the TS-1001 document under the SAS general requirement number 222. So there's basically a priority of a uh, priority specified over there on what the SAS should use depending on the information it has available from the CBSD. And of course, we prioritize this to maximize the spec the high to max maximize the highest spectral efficiency in the CBRS band. So this parameter is uh, the this parameter can only be done ex uh, the the parameters associated with this fit can only be exchanged in the registration procedure. So this is something fundamental that the SAS needs to know uh, at uh, registration time. Next slide, please. Yeah. And the other feature, as Andy mentioned, that we're working on is the CPE to CBSD indicator. So this allows uh, a CPE to indicate to the SAS whether it's a CPE, CBSD or not. And this can be done uh, via two methods. One is via, during the registration procedure. The CPE can indicate to the SAS that it's a CPE, CBSD. And this is via a parameter outside the installation parameter, so it does not necessarily require a CPI to be involved if you want to update this. And the other method is du during feature capability exchange request uh, message or procedure. So during this feature capability exchange, if a, if a CBSD wants to be a, a CPE wants to be uh, informed the SAS that now it's a CPE CBSD then it, would, it can use this to do it dynamically without having to go through a registration procedure. Okay, so the next slide, please. Yeah, so that, that was it for TS3002. From TS3003 point of view, which is the SAS to SAS interface, uh, we have to do, uh, implement similar uh, changes as we did for, release, uh, for TS3002. Over here, we have to also implement a feature capability exchange procedure, and this enables uh, peer SASs to exchange their capabilities of what feature IDs they support and what third-party proprietary features they support. Uh, if uh, release one, if, if the release one SAS is involved during uh, this capability exchange, it, it would not provide a feature capability list since uh, it's, it's not aware of this parameter. So um, via that, then a release two SAS would be aware that this is a release one SAS and it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, communicate it anything related to release two. The feature IDs which are allowed to be exchanged during the SAS to SAS feature capability exchange are specified in TS3003, the WinForum ones, the proprietary ones outside the scope of WinForum. And the only feature for which information can be exchanged as of today between PSS during the synchronization process is related to the enhanced grouping. So for enhanced grouping, release to SAS may exchange, may optionally exchange the grouping information related to the CBSDs. Next slide. Yep, and that's all I had. Thanks, Naveen. So a couple of questions have come up um, um, related to the antenna database. How do you know which antennas are in the database? So the antenna database is pre-populated before. So it's uh, vendor is the CBSD users and CS, CBS and the SAS admins, if I'm not mistaken, have the right uh, to populate the database. So the database has to be populated beforehand. So when the antenna ID is used uh, during the registration procedure, the, the SAS can actually obtain a pattern. If it fails, then it has to fall back to other uh, antenna patterns. Maybe in worst case, it has to fall back to the release one information. Thanks. Um, and uh, actually, we have a couple of questions that may uh, you may want to bring Andy in for discussion as well. Uh, the first one is, um, what does relaying of group information to a CBSD mean? How is this helpful to the SAS or the CBSD? 
so I think the question uh, is more why do we need okay no go ahead Naveen so if I understood the question rightly is it more on why do we need group what's the fun what's the fundamental use case of grouping yeah I think, I, I, I think that's how I would interpret the question uh, what how is it how is it being used yeah so I mean the different group types that uh, have been defined and uh, they are used for different purposes. Some group types are identified uh, for, for example, for uh, a specific, for a very specific purpose, like it, it can be the passive DAS. So all the CBSDs that are, or that are part of a passive DAS have a very specific treatment and they have some limitations on how, or, or have some requirements from the SAS point of view and how they should be treated. So we look at the passive DAS example. Uh, in a passive DAS, you could have several TRPs or antennas which are powered by a single port from a radio unit. And since it's a passive DAS, the, there's no amplification along the, that uh, line towards the TPs. And the way the SAS, uh, the SAS has to treat that is different because there's a dependency between all the TPs on the, uh, hanging off that port. Then you could also have other groups for coexistence purposes, or you could have groups for uh, single frequency groups, for example, for fixed wireless access deployments, where you want uh, a, C a CPE CBSDs to be under the control of a certain CBSD. Okay, thanks, Naveen. Uh, we've gotten some other questions in. I'm going to hold them to the end if we have time. Um, and now I'm going to uh, hand things over to Richard Bernhardt from WISPA. Richard's going to speak on release to use cases and deployment cases. Richard? Hey, everybody. Welcome. Um, take a big breath. There's a lot of new information that's been provided to you. And thanks to Lee Preston and, and Naveen and Andy, um, they've given a pretty good base of where we're going with release two. Um, the interesting part of all of this is that we started out in, in general development and were ready to go with CBRS for a long time. We waited and waited and waited and finally got into ICD, uh, got to test out some, some uh, uses and to see if the system and the ecosystem for CBRS would operate. And finally, at the beginning of the year, we were able to launch. Um, and that was a very exciting thing. And perhaps the most exciting thing is beginning to see how the system, the ecosystem for CBRS is going to be used. So hopefully over the next few minutes, I'm gonna to demonstrate to you the, the fruits and the, of the labors, why you're on this webinar, uh, why you, potentially why you have interest in CBRS and how you can use it, and to demonstrate some actual uses that are already deployed in the field, even early on in the ecosystem. First off, I'm Richard Bernhardt. I'm with the uh, National Spectrum Advisor for WISPA, and I'm also the chair of Working Group 5, which is the operations portion of the SSC at WinForum. We cover a lot of different topics um, having to do with best practices and the direction in which operations apply to CBRS, things like CPI and training for CPI and certification and PKI, coexistence in the band and other things. So release two is, is critically important to operations and you'll be seeing documents coming out from the uh, working group uh, five pertinent to um, the execution and operation of uses and methodologies for using release two features and functions. Uh, and we're very excited about doing that. So let's let's move into the, the topic a little bit. If you'd move into the next slide, Lee. So I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about use cases. We're gonna delve into markets and verticals. We're gonna talk what's been um, out there or what's now out there. I'm gonna talk about future and what can come in. Um, also how release two might add to the type of use cases that are available. For those of you who have entered the CBRS platform or thinking about it, CBRS provides a platform of, for very high performance deployments. Uh, but the cool thing about it is it's technology agnostic and it open and it's open to and uses diverse use cases. Uh, this goes from the very simple, uh, maybe just a few radios within an area, maybe an inside or internal or um, inside network uh, to a small point to point or point to multi point network to very complex expansive networks, um, including mobility networks that can be covering the entire nation 
um, and more. We'll delve into what that and more means in just a moment. Because CBRS is, a, is technology agnostic, it invites innovation. And that's the cool thing about the, the release two, um, because what release two says is that we've got an innovation base. Um, we have a platform. Now let's combine the two things to come up with novel and exciting uses for the band. Um, and, and the other thing about this band is it doesn't, partic it doesn't focus only on one type of use. It spans all of the uses, including fixed and mobility and interconnected networks and even standalone networks uh, and private networks. Um, it, it is governed by Part 96. Um, and the standards that we're talking today uh, about are governed by or are, are drafted by WinForum and the combination of the rules and the standards give the platform that we need in order to move forward. I'm asked frequently, this last line on this slide, I'm asked frequently, is CBRS in competition with Wi-Fi? or is Wi-Fi being replaced by CBRS? And the answer is categorically, it's how you want to use it. Um, in many cases, um, you're going to see Wi-Fi and CBRS right alongside each other. Um, one doesn't necessarily replace the other. In some cases they do, but in some cases, and in many cases, you're going to see the continuation of Wi-Fi right along CBRS. So will be an extension of uh, the spectrum available along with the capability of using Wi-Fi. Let's move to the next slide. So what are some of the cases that um, you can deploy CBRS in. If you are an operator uh, or a network uh, company or, a, or a, a company that wants to get something done wirelessly, you have a lot of choices in CBRX. Um, near and dear to my heart, because I, I, I work with the wireless internet service providers, is fixed wireless networks. And this is where uh, networks that occur point to point or point to multipoint using microwave and, and or a combination of various types of methodologies, deploy CBRS networks in order to reach clients of all different kinds. One very specific type of provider is a WISP or wireless internet service provider. WISPs uh, provide services substantially in rural and suburban environments, although some of them also do it in urban environments and provide um, very directed services and CBRS is a perfect solution for them because in the beginning uh, between ICD and the, and the present time, many of them are converting their uses over from the traditional Part 90N uh, operating license into CBRS. Part 90N operated in the top portion of what is now CBRS, 3650 to 3700. Um, those licenses will be coming to a sunset, most of them in October of this year, some of them carrying out to around 2023. But the cool thing about the use cases there is many of the use cases are already existing and will be winding directly into CBRS. CBRS is a network of both indoor and outdoor operations. In fact, they can cross over between the two. They can be an independent indoor, they can be an independent outdoor, um, and the, the networks can be uh, connected or they can be private in nature and so that gives you the extensibility to operate uh, in many different places. Um, cable network and ne network operators such as MSOs will be using um, the options with CBRS to extend their networks especially in areas where their uh, strands don't specifically extend so they may be within a county and want to extend into an area that is not covered by their particular cable network um, using microwave and using CBRS, they're able to extend that network. Verticals like utilities and energy are using them already for the operation of their equipment, for smart meters and for other parameters. A very, very popular type of deployment for CBRS is the Internet of Things. And typically when consumers think of Internet of Things, they think of fancy sweaters that light up and give messages. This is not really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about IoT. We're really talking about the industrial Internet of Things or uh, an advanced SCADA device system, if you will, which has a lot of sensors, potentially cameras, and can run, operate, and uh, manage machinery. Um, they can, they can geofence, they can do all kinds of functions, and a lot of that can be achieved through CBRS. We'll go into a little more detail about a specific use case in that area in a few moments. They can do security and surveillance. They can do industrial and commercial and residential monitoring. 
agriculture, such as moisture sensing, precision agriculture, dairy sensors, and a wide range of other functions. Um, you may already be seeing, if you uh, assume, assuming you go to a shopping center these days, um, if you were to go into a shopping center or an office building, that parking is monitored by IoT. And so uh, the parking and availability of parking is something that can be run by CBRS. Really critical to CBRS is that private networks can be formed, um, very especially private LTE networks, which provide single or multiple locations the ability to have their own uh, dynamic networks. Those networks can be themselves self-contained or they can connect uh, with roaming into more public networks as well. We're going to see industry and business use CBRS um, at the same time, um, interconnecting and um, in the operation of their businesses and in the operation of industry. Um, and we're on the residential and business um, building side, uh, we are already seeing the deployment into MDUs or multi-unit dwellings and multi-tenant um, enterprises. Um, another rather um, unique aspect that will be coming to CBRS is something called a neutral host network. So if, for example, you are running a stadium or an entertainment facility or uh, a hotel, and you want to be the central host for a lot of different networks, you may put in one set of equipment that has the ability to accommodate many, many different um, operators, and CBRS can play a central role in that. And of course, the, the, the locations are much greater than the ones listed there, ven venues and stadiums, accommodations, and workplaces. But the idea of neutral host is to provide a, a, an aspect where you can come in and create your own network base with equipment that accommodates more than one operator. And then, of course, the traditional uses such as mobile networks and 5G LTE and NR and NRU are coming and are being deployed right now as we speak across the United States. CBRS has already been incorporated into handsets um, and networks are being deployed by various operators uh, and MNOs across the US and we mentioned private, private mobile networks before. So let's move into the vertical markets. Next slide, please. So, the vertical markets are a little bit up to your imagination, and I put a list here because I know of uses in CBRS in every single one of these. And I, by uses, I don't mean theoretical uses, I mean actual uses. These are deployments that have actually been deployed in the field and are being operated right now. Um, clearly with uh, COVID-19 and the, the uh, need for people to be isolated and, and have to do things different from what we've done before, telemedicine, uh, medical and dental office operations and hospitals, they're operating very differently and depending much more upon uh, broadband than, than they ever have before. We have seen, at least through WISPA, we've seen a large number of carriers, a large number of ISPs using CBRS for telemedicine. Same thing in education, remote education, whether it's K through 12 or higher education, huge uptick in the amount of uses supplying um, areas especially that um, need it very heavily because they weren't adequately served or not served at all. In the industrial and commercial sector, growing like wildfire, security, surveillance, hospitality and accommodations, venues, retail, multifamily residential, airports and campuses, oil and gas, energy, health and doctor's offices, um, power and utility systems, telecommunications and more. So you can see the imagination is really uh, there for which uh, marketplace to go for. Let's look at some very specific examples and move on to the next slide. So um, we looked at um, some of the things that have been put out into the field um, and what, what are some of the applications that could be used to put across a CBRS network. Um, I mentioned earlier a private network. Private networks um, are credentialed users within a specified network. Um, definitely can be a CBRS network um, that can be isolated or it can be interconnected by rights to other uh, networks. That gives you the flexibility to do campuses in education, uh, campuses in industry, um, or uh, utilize it in uh, government, municipalities, and other places, and also connect to other networks should you want to or isolate rights. Delivery of video content, um, becoming a very, very important aspect to all broadband delivery um, with a fairly high um, uh, demand factor. Uh, 
used in security and surveillance, um, also in the delivery of entertainment and a myriad of other uses. Mobile communications network, CBRS is being used in back office deployments for networks designating uh, specific communications for their, for their employees. Uh, there is some public safety use of CBRS and certainly it's an extension of existing um, uh, mobile networks both as a primary and as a secondary source of, of spectrum. And then as I've mentioned before, Internet of Things, um, the use may be uh, very, very seriously used now in industrial applications such as manufacturing, time-based measurement, uh, device control, geofencing, and a wide array of industrial applications. Next slide, please. So there are, are some specific uses that uh, we, we've seen arise. Uh, one is because of release two, there is now the ability to identify groups. And as um, I believe uh, Naveen and others mentioned, one of the new functions for release two is identifying single or common frequency groups. Um, this allows for networks that operate on a common frequency to be able to define that, free, that uh, network as that way and, and let the SAS know that there's an importance if they have to move or change or add uh, to their network that they need to stay within that common frequency. And that allows both the, the um, access point or the eNode B and the client device to move in concert um, if it's possible when you're not in, interrupting, a, a, not to interrupt an, an incumbent, um, as they like move as a unit with a single frequency. Let's move to the next slide. Some specific examples of use cases are precision agriculture. Um, agri uh, an agricultural vendor is currently using this to provide continuous surveillance and tracking of their, of their farming fields. Uh, they are building out an LTE CBRS system for continuous monitoring and to operate their watering systems, to check moisture, uh, to use um, with their dairy functions, and a wide range of other things uh, on farms and agricultural fields in the United States. I mentioned the fixed wireless use, the WISP use, which is used all across the United States, uh, providing connectivity. Um, and then sometimes CBRS takes the place of another band where um, we've seen the um, WISPs and fixed operators replacing license deployments um, or other license deployments such as 2.5 in moving it into CBRS, providing for services within their region. Um, Naveen mentioned passive DAS. Uh, we expect to see in-building passive DAS on the grow with CBRS that can be just about anywhere. Uh, same thing with smart cities, where an example is seen in, in Ohio, uh, where it is already being deployed. Next slide, please. So um, the most immediate functions that we've seen from, from the beginning of, of um, ICD into full commercial deployment was the commercial transmission or translation from Part 90 into Part 96. Thousands and ton, thousands of, of devices have converted into CBRS. Uh, for fixed functions. We're seeing them in rural and suburban deployments in low density with a very high uh, success rate. We're seeing managed service deployments across CBRS where the um, devices and the uses are being controlled by a central management system. And again, Internet of Things, those are the ones that we're seeing predominantly right now. Move forward, please. Other examples include oil and gas sector, um, a, a considerable number of oil and gas sector, uh, a lot of them transferred over as well as the energy sector from part 90 into 96, cable options, mobility we've already discussed, and transportation systems. Let's move to, to the next slide, please. So the conclusion here is CBRS provides, especially with release two, a great flexibility in the dynamics of the types of use cases. The imagination pretty much is, is what's the limitation on use cases because if you have a specific need, you can raise a feature or function that you need in release two, have it heard, have a standard um, issued for that to cover that so the SASs and devices are aware of what that group uh, it need is, um, and as we'll see over time, um, the the growth in CBRS will cross over all of those different verticals. Finally, I wanted to leave you with what's going on today. If you uh, 
if you could ignore the pandemic, uh, perhaps that would be a better thing. But since you can't, uh, know that uh, broadband solutions have increased incrementally over the time of the pandemic. And uh, that has also given a strong boost to uses in CBRS. We want to hear about your use, your technology integration, and how CBRS deployments are making a difference to you please let us know. Uh, we want to post them on the website. We want to give an idea of how CBRS standards are being used and how Release 2 is functioning. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Richard. Are there any questions for Richard before we move on? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so we'll move on to our final speaker of the day. Uh, it's Virgil Sempu from Ericsson. Uh, so Virgil, take it away. Hi, Lee. Thank you. Um, please move to the next page. So for WinForum Release 2, uh, we have a very well-defined process on how devices, both CBSDs and SASIs, uh, get certified. And FCC has agreed to use WinForum technical specification and uh, I'm quoting here the technical specification 61 as well as uh, 122. Uh, these are the test specification actually. So they, they are used today to uh, test the CBSD and SAS is operated in uh, CBRS band. And on the right side, you have an example of such uh, test uh, configuration where for, uh, and this is, both of these examples are for testing either individual CBSDs or the combination of a domain proxy and a CBSD which are tested together. So you have a SAS test harness which is uh, triggering different uh, uh, test vectors towards the uh, unit under test which is the CBSD and then uh, the, the unit under test is also connected to um, uh, RF test equipment to monitor you know the transmission in the CBRS band. Um, um, so, uh, uh, given that, uh, you know, in Elise 2, we have a uh, uh, different type of feature, so we can uh, leave, we can move to the next page. Uh, we, uh, as described by Andy and uh, also by Navin, we have uh, uh, different features introduced in Elise 2, and uh, the, the Two big categories of these features are the non-regulatory impacting features. Uh, these are the one described by Preston as not impacting the interference towards incumbents. And uh, I'm listing here quite a number of features which are uh, non-regulatory impacting, like for example, the feature capability exchange, the enhanced CBSD group handling, the CP CBSD indicator, the single, fre single frequency group, and also in some limited usages, even the enhanced antenna pattern can be non-regulatory impacted as long as it's not used to estimate interference towards incumbent, uh, and it's only used to estimate interference between GAA users, then even that feature can be considered as being non-regulatory impacting. And then there are other types of features which are uh, regulatory impacting. They are impacting the, either the incumbent protection or the pile protection. And uh, uh, again, uh, in this case, the enhanced antenna pattern, if it is used for the purpose of estimating interference towards PALs or towards incumbent, then it becomes, uh, uh, you know, a regulatory impacting because it will impact uh, the interference described in Part 96, the interference control. Um, so uh, from testing perspective and, and for certification perspective, we have to treat these two features separately because any regulatory impacting features will probably have to go through a very rigorous uh, FCC test, uh, uh, you know, performed by a certified test house versus for the non-regulatory impacting, the goal is to create a very agile environment where basically the industry will try to self-certify. So we can move to the next uh, uh, page, please. So basically, the from a testing perspective, uh, the, the starting point, of course, is all the devices operating in the band, both SAS and CBSD, the baseline, they have to be certified for release to operation. And then 
for those devices who chose to implement or release two features, then for every individual feature, the question is, is that particular feature regulatory impacting? If it is, then this will uh, require further FCC certification on top of what release one certification has already done. And um, if that feature is not regulatory impacting, that's where the industry can you know, do some uh, self-testing to assert conformance with that particular feature. Um, next page, Lee. So uh, for the part, uh, for the self-testing part, um, uh, for a feature which are non-regulatory uh, impacting, uh, WinForum has defined a self-testing policy, and this is captured in the document uh, WinForum TS 4005. And for the people who are not familiar with how the documents are numbered, this 4005, the first number four, represent the working group, which is the working group four test and certification working group. So that's a document which was produced by working group four. And uh, it, uh, it's a document describing what are the, I would say, the requirements for in, uh, individual companies to self-test their, uh, their products against the features which are non-regulatory impacting. Um, so basically for the companies, uh, who would like to use this process, they have to agree with the policies and procedure uh, set forth in the uh, TS 4005. Uh, and um, uh, that will allow them at the end of a process to claim conformance with the WinForm standard for that list of feature that they are looking to obtain uh, to, or to assert conformance against. Um, so basically, what uh, uh, what are these policies and procedure? Uh, first of all, uh, the company has to agree to follow the test specification defined by the Win Forum, um, and they also have to agree to use the test harness is going to be developed by Win Forum. And I, I showed in uh, an earlier slide, you know, how the SAS test harness, for example, it's used to drive a CBSD unit under test. So basically what we're saying here is where applicable, the company should use that uh, uh, WinForum defined test harness. And then the final requirement would be to submit uh, an official company letter head, uh, uh, um, I would say a summary of all the tests that have been performed. And uh, that the official letter has to be accompanied by a full test report uh, which has to be submitted to the Win Forum. And then Win Forum will maintain a public website which will basically uh, describe all the products which went through this self testing uh, process and uh, which products are compliant with which feature as defined by Win Forum. Um, now, initially, we were approach is to test each feature independently, each release two feature independently, but uh, Going forward, uh, if uh, it would make sense to have a certain group of feature provided together, then the idea is to uh, define feature bundles or profiles, which will allow, uh, I would say, an, uh, an easier designation of what kind of uh, uh, capabilities a device has. So, uh, so if, if se several features are basically related with each other and together provide a uh, and a certain uh, applicability or a, a certain uh, use for, for an application, then those features can be bundled together and then uh, the devices can certify against the bundle saying, okay, we support uh, uh, the bun the, this particular bundle. And examples could be, for example, you know, uh, uh, you know coexistence feature bundle or might be something related to different uh, use cases as described by Richard. So if a certain use case requires certain features, then those features will be bundled together. Now, we, when we win forum do recognize that, uh, you know, um, self-testing, it's, uh, it's uh, I would say, the, the baseline or the foundation, but uh, of it, to establish a strong ecosystem, also interoperability testing between different devices with different SaaSes is required. So, um, so basically, we 
uh, wind forum does uh, encourage this interoperability testing to happen uh, and uh, this might be part of you know business business arrangement between, between different parties but it's not required as part of wind forum self testing policy this is and of uh, proof to other customers that a certain CBSD device is working fine and has been uh, uh, testing not just against a generic uh, test harness, but uh, against a specific SAS, for example. So then, you know, uh, that, that can be used to further, you know, uh, assure the customers that, you know, a certain company, CBSD, uh, would operate with these uh, SASs and has been tested, uh, you know, individually both SASs. Next slide. Uh, so basically, this is kind of a, we already covered it, but it's just a, a very quick summary of self-testing agreement. So for the companies wishing to self-test either a SAS or a CBSD or the combination of a domain proxy and a CBSD, they shall sign an agreement, um, then uh, pro proceed to test their products against the feature uh, they uh, are planning to support or they are supporting to demonstrate compliance and the, uh, the feature has going to be tested against the test specification produced by the wind forum um, and uh, there are uh, as described by by Navin there are some features which are mandatory and some which are optional so if for release two any any device uh, uh, claiming support for list two has to support the mandatory feature, but there are very few of those. And the majority of release two feature is going to be optional. And then for each release two feature, basically for every optional release two feature, uh, the devices can pick and choose which one they will submit to Inforum to claim uh, that they are, uh, you know, they are, uh, they support that particular feature. Um, so, uh, as, as mentioned before, it is recommended to use the wind forum test harness. Uh, and uh, then at the end of a testing, so each, each uh, company will run uh, the test independently uh, in their own house. So they don't have to go to third party test houses, which will both save a lot of money and uh, a lot of time. Um, and then at the end, once the test report has been produced, then the company will produce a declaration uh, which will list all the features that have been tested and uh, also uh, um, uh, then submit an official letter towards the wind forum summarizing all the tests and, and also including the test report. Okay, uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. This is just to show an example of the letters of the uh, declaration of compliance. So basically there is on the left side, there is one letter for uh, CBSD uh, manufacturers and on the right side, it's a letter from or for to be used by the SAS administrator. So it's a very straightforward, just saying that the company uh, declares that a certain product, either a SAS or a CBSD, uh, with a particular either FCC ID for CBSD or with an FRN, F, FRN for a SAS, has passed Wind Forum list two test cases, and uh, they also there is a list of release two uh, optional features that have been tested, and then there is a signature and the name of a person, you know, uh, signing the, the declaration. So I think that's it, uh, Lee, you can open it for questions. Sure. Uh, so there are there any questions for Virgil on the um, self-testing model that the Wind Forum is uh, uh, program that the Wind Forum is putting putting in place for release two? Yeah, maybe one more one more thought. Uh, as Andy said, and I think that's that's very important. So uh, you know, there are there are some FCC I was, I was, there are some features which are going to be um, uh, requiring or impacting the 
Part 96 or regulatory impacting. And for those, the FCC will have to, uh, you know, work with Wind Forum to uh, uh, decide how those regulatory impacting features are going to be tested, basically. So for that one, the, the process is ongoing. We don't have a clear framework for testing additional release to feature on top of the release one. Uh, but uh, the idea here, since the majority of the feature release two are, are basically non-regulatory impacting, I think this framework of self-testing self uh, provides a very agile way to, you know, uh, add features, uh, you know, uh, very uh, uh, continuously add feature, and it's going to be easy to test and, and, and provide, uh, I would say, assurances to the, uh, to the customers that those features have been tested according to WinForum procedures, right? And, and uh, WinForum basically will have a web page listing all the CBSDs which have undergone this process. So it, it is a control process, but it means to, it, uh, it's designed to be very agile and to allow, you know, addition of a feature as we go along. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, a, a full release uh, certification. It's just as new features are added to the specification, they can be also added to the test uh, conformance. So. so we've received uh, one question in virtual. Uh, how long does it take to self-test a feature or set of features? Yeah, but uh, it's a good, uh, good question. I, and I think it all depends on the, I would say, the, uh, the way the, each, each individual company organizes its uh, uh, the products for, for CBRS. So, for example, if um, there is a company who has already a product which they had to go uh, through release one testing, you know, they, uh, so they, they should be already familiar with, uh, uh, you know, the test harness and the release two test harness are, is going to be built on the release one test harness. So if, if a company is it's already been familiar with release one, then I would say the self-test will be just a, a, a minor increment on top of that and the testing can happen quite rapidly. However, if it's a company who has, you know, uh, basically used a test house and never had a setup in, in their own lab labs to test a certain equipment, then for those uh, companies where there might be a little bit of maybe you know ramp up to be able to set up the test harness to be able to do the self testing but in general uh, i think majority of the companies they already went through a fcc release one testing and they are pretty familiar with the existing test harness setup so for for those companies the increment is quite low okay thanks virgil um why don't we open it up to some general questions now? Uh, the first one that uh, I have received is a question for Andy as to when he believes a, uh, a clutter model will be available in release two. Uh, approximately when will it be available and will it be a proprietary and or will it be a proprietary feature? Um. Okay, so it's a good question. It's a complicated question because uh, it involves uh, basically three aspects, each of which are relatively uncertain right now. So the short answer to your question is it's going to be a while. It won't be this year, for example. And the reason it's complicated is um, where such a clutter model comes into use would be in protecting incumbents or protecting PALs. From interference and so obviously as Virgil alluded to the FCC would have uh, a strong say into how that goes how that has to be certified so to implement a clutter model we're most likely looking at a certification cycle or something um, in order to do that so uh, it's not um, you know, it's not something we could do quickly, mostly because of the uh, uncertainty with regard to how it would be certified. Um, the other challenge uh, we have with clutter models is that not every SAS administrator has the um, uh, access to the same level of clutter 
data. Uh, some SAS administrators have very detailed clutter data as part of their normal course of business. Other SAS administrators may not have any. The way release one works at the moment is all of the SASs have to come up with the same answer. Um, when we go to predicting interference margin and things like that, as soon as you move to a point where one SAS administrator has different um, uh, clutter data than another, then they're obviously not going to get the same answer out of their propagation model. And so a method to deal with the fact that not every SAS is getting the same answer um, has to be developed. And at the moment, we don't have an approved solution for that. We have some thoughts on that, but we don't have an approved solution. Um, so that's the that's the other consideration that goes um, with you th using the clutter model. And then, of course, the third thing is we'd have to um, you know decide what clutter model is appropriate. So uh, it's one of the reasons why advanced propagation models has not made its way into the draft release two spec yet, because there are so many of these other issues that are um, hanging over it. Um, but I can tell you it's something that's of intense interest to almost every SAS administrator because it will add another layer of efficiency to the use of the spectrum because right now we're leaving spectrum on the table because we're not taking um, clutter into explicit account. And uh, when you do, obviously, there's tremendously more greater number of, of, of sharing opportunities than when you don't use it. Our own propagation testing shows you know, 50 or 60 dB of difference between what uh, propagation models predict and what you actually observe when you uh, do to clutter. So we're very interested in incorporating it. It's not going to be this year, but we're hoping to get something as soon as possible. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to everyone. Uh, that's the end of our time. So uh, one last thing before we go, the next online event that's going to be hosted by the Wireless Innovation Forum is a three-day deep dive into spectrum sharing, past, present, and future. Uh, you can find information on this uh, deep dive at uh, wirelessinnovation.org slash spectrum sharing deep dive. The dates, if you want to save them on your calendar, are the 22nd to the 24th of September, 2020. So with that, I'll close the webinar. Thanks again to all the speakers. Uh, we really appreciate the time they took to uh, prepare the materials and, and present it here today. And thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, we hope you got value out of this, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event.